Hi, this is the Journal Star editorial board interview with uh, Danielle Conrad for uh, legislative seat. Oh, I just checked this out and now I lost it. Oh, District 46. The fight in 46. You, yeah, you would know that, wouldn't you? I could have just asked if I kind of bluffed my way through that. Danielle, thanks for being with us. I'm Dave Bundy, editor of the Journal Star. Uh, Danielle, you'll uh, reintroduce yourself shortly. Kent, want to say hi? Hi, again. Uh, <laughs> Kent Walgamot, I write about arts and entertainment, but in this context, I've been on the editorial board for well over a decade. We've done this a few times before. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, Danielle, we have a series of questions for you. Uh, the last one is... Uh, is sort of an open-ended one. Uh, so we will just launch right into this. First of all, um, you know, you've already served, so you know a thing or two about the legislature. Why do you, uh, why do you want to be back in the legislature and what experiences and attributes qualify you uh, for that? Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Dave and Kent, and to the full editorial board for the opportunity to participate in the process. Uh, my name is Danielle Conrad. I'm running for Legislative District 46. The, to be responsive to your question, the reason I jumped into this race uh, is because I saw some storm clouds gathering on the Nebraska political horizon, and I was concerned about the direction our state was taking. And I thought if I could possibly do more with my unique experiences um, and relationships to try and make a positive difference for our beloved Nebraska, I have to try. I can't be content to furrow my brow when I read the headlines. Uh, I have to be willing to lead and to take action. So I jumped in very late to the race, um, but because of that experience, because of that positive approach, with a lot of hustle, I was very honored to win a first place finish in the primary in just about an eight week campaign with a five point spread and a three person race. And my message of experienced positive leadership is really resonating with voters in North Lincoln and stakeholders across the political spectrum. Our beloved legislature has been, I think very much hollowed out due to term limits and some key retirements. And so having people that understand the issues and the process and the rules and who have relationships across the political spectrum and across the state, those are the key ingredients to making good policy for Nebraskans. And I am honored and proud to have those attributes. And so it's been a lot of fun to get back out on the campaign trail. Um, and one thing that I wanna to note too about the experience piece is that uh, in addition to being a distinguishing factor in this race, because of our political landscape and dynamic, if honored to be elected for the third time, I would have the second most seniority in the body behind only my friend, Senator Aguilar. And so that would afford me an opportunity to seek key leadership positions on things like the Appropriations Committee and to provide balance and a stabilizing force on key committees like executive board rules and committee on committees, um, which I have experience serving on in the past. So I, I really feel like that is one of the, the most significant factors that compelled me to uh, rejoin the campaign trail. All right. Um, so you've perhaps you were referring to it with your with the storm clouds comment, mm -hmm. but you know we're a, it feels like we're a divided nation. We're a divided state. Um, how do you represent or can you represent uh, constituents who see things differently than you? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, for anyone who's feeling um, concerned about democracy or the state of our world, and there's a lot of reasons to be concerned, I would highly recommend going to knock on about let's see, 5,000 <laughs> of your neighbor's doors, which I've done since I've been out on the campaign trail this year. And because we're a nonpartisan race, we talk to everyone as it should be, Republicans, Democrats, independents. And I think that it has been just crystal clear to me in those conversations 
that people were dismayed about the tenor and tone of the gubernatorial primary in Nebraska. They're concerned about efforts to dismantle our nonpartisan leadership really across the political spectrum. And people want less partisanship and more consensus building and more working together um, in their politics. They can see that very clearly and they can understand how that impacts their lives. Uh, we would not uh, tolerate that level of approach or discourse in our homes or our schools or our businesses, and we shouldn't tolerate it in our politics. So we can have strong viewpoints and be strong advocates, but we can also and should also seek consensus and common ground and compromise. Um, and build bridges across the political spectrum and across the urban rural divide. So one thing that I think is really important to being able to represent constituents that we may find a disagreement about on a discrete issue here or there is being honest about why we have that disagreement, sharing information about how I came to that conclusion or position in a forthright manner, which I think people definitely respect and understand, even if we ultimately disagree, but to do so respectfully and to seek that common ground. Um, I know that as I've been out talking to voters who maybe have a different point of view than I do on, say, for example, some key social issues, they've been very um, supported supportive and excited about my work in business development in the legislature um, over the years. They've been very supportive of my work in maintaining Nebraska's strong open government to protect unpopular points of view. Uh, so there's always more that unites us, I think, than divides us. And I think it's important to be honest with your constituents when you have a disagreement, to be respectful and recognize they too have sincerely held beliefs and to find that common ground that, that you can come together on for the next issue or the other issues imp impacting their lives. All right, um, so immigration is largely a federal issue, but it, it pops up as a state issue from time to time. It certainly uh, had uh, the legislature's attention a, a few times. What, um, Given the role that the state can play, what are your priorities? What are your uh, solutions? Where do you think Nebraska ought, ought to be in terms of, of immigration law? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I've had an opportunity to work um, on some of the areas of state and local public policy that intersect with our federal immigration system. I started my career as a staff attorney building the policy program at Nebraska Appleseed, and then for the last eight years have led a historic civil rights organization in Nebraska at the ACLU. So we've worked really hand in glove with state and local policymakers on a host of issues to move for a more thoughtful immigration policy where those intersections do present themselves and to be strong advocates to our federal delegation um, so that they can help to move towards a more thoughtful immigration policy and towards, um, say, for example, comprehensive immigration reform, which is supported by faith leaders, business leaders, ag interests, um, and civil rights leaders really across the spectrum. So some progress we've made in Nebraska, for example, has been driver's licenses for DACA recipients, professional licensure for DACA recipients and TPS holders and others who are lawfully present to be able to participate um, in our transportation systems and our professional workforce systems. And I think immigration absolutely has to be a part of the puzzle when it comes to addressing our workforce and our demographic and population challenges in Nebraska. Um, key business leaders like the Nebraska Chamber of Commerce and beyond have also recognized that it was a hot topic at the federal fly-in this summer uh, for business and political leaders to talk about. So I think as state legislators, we can be thoughtful about the areas where we can make a positive difference and we can work collaboratively with our federal delegation to try and move towards immigration reform policies that better suit Nebraska's needs. All right, uh, next question for you. Um, you know, accusations of voter fraud have cast doubt on the election process in places, uh, sort of a couple of questions. 
What would you do if you were pressured to play a role in overturning an election and uh, sort of a, a little bit related to that? Are, are more protections needed as far as voting rights or voting security? Sure. Well, there's no question that this is a hot topic. Um, I will tell you, though, that we are very fortunate in Nebraska for a host of different reasons. Um, one, we have historically and presently maintained a paper ballot system, which provides for a lot of accountability for voters and for election officials, um, and has prevented some of those questions and concerns that have arisen in other states. Additionally, um, the data is very clear that we have almost no voter fraud in Nebraska. That's because we have the systems in place to ensure fair and free elections. We have hardworking poll workers across the state who take their job very, very seriously. And we have a statutory framework and mechanisms in place to detect and to hold accountable anybody who would um, commit voter fraud. That being said, would I overturn the will of the people um, in, in a free and fair election? No, I would not. I would work very diligently to honor the will of the people, even if I disagreed with the outcome of that election, because that is a cornerstone of our democracy. And we need to be very careful and thoughtful stewards about protecting the will of the people while of course respecting minority rights. But when it comes to free and fair elections, um, I would not take part in undermining the will of the people. Additional measures that we can take in Nebraska to make our elections more free and fair. There's always more work to be done in terms of updating our data systems. There's always more work to be done in terms of ensuring our poll workers have the training and resources they need to do their job. And I think what we've seen in Nebraska is a continued rise in terms of interest for vote by mail, for example. Um, and that can um, continue, I think, to expand to meet more Nebraskans need. Nebraska was an early adopter of no excuses, absentee balloting, and we saw historic turnout um, during the pandemic and, and since and people utilizing that, that form of letting their voice be heard. So I think overall, we need to work very carefully to not infringe upon the fundamental rights of voters to participate in our electoral system. That being said, voter ID is gonna be on our ballot this November. And um, my sense is, is that will pass based upon the experience that we've seen in our sister states. So I think it's very important that Nebraskans look at that measure and um, remember a couple of things. Um, number one, it due to a, a host of different concerns, it delegates almost all of the decision-making about implementation of that measure to the legislature. So there will be absolutely um, a host of key decisions that will need to be made in 2023 and moving forward about what that means to ensure that we don't um, deny an opportunity to vote for otherwise eligible Nebraskans and that we facilitate a process that provides access to a valid photo ID for people who can't afford it um, or who are having challenges otherwise. So um, I do, I plan to vote no on that measure to be very forthright because I don't think it's necessary. Um, but I do think that it will pass. And I do think that the Nebraska legislature is going to have a lot of important decisions to make about what that means for our future elections moving forward, how that impacts the rise of vote by mail, how that impacts the approximately 11 counties that are all male counties in Nebraska, um, how that impacts students and seniors and people who are differently abled or who um, are low income and can't afford a state ID or a driver's license for various reasons. So um, there's some good models out there from our sister states about how to make those kinds of um, laws more workable and to mitigate the impacts of um, voter suppression. So I'm very excited to, to dig in and help to be and, and hope to be helpful in bringing that knowledge and experience as a civil rights attorney um, to bear on some of those key decisions moving forward so that our elections continue to be strong, fair and free in Nebraska. All right. Um, the Supreme Court has uh, pretty much sent the decision about uh, abortion back to the states. Uh, the legislature will undoubtedly be dealing with this. 
uh, describe your views on prohibiting, limiting, or allowing abortion in Nebraska. Sure. Uh, this is absolutely a hot topic, one that I hear about sometimes even more so than the perennial hot topic of property taxes as I've been out knocking those doors and, and making those phone calls and talking to voters. Um, people are rightly and deeply concerned about um, how this change in the, the lenses that we view our fundamental rights um, are, they're, they're very concerned about how this is happening um, in the, the wake of the Supreme Court decision. And so this will leave the decision to the states. Um, I think it is absolutely imperative to underline the fact that I have been a leader in the legislature for eight years, eight years since, and would be honored to lead again on day one in protecting fundamental rights. Um, it is absolutely critical to know the issues and the process and the rules in order to have a thoughtful process there. So what, where we are in Nebraska today is that we have a, a host of restrictions on access to abortion already on the books. Um, but what we don't have is a total ban. And the total bans that have been introduced in recent years are absolutely a bridge too far for most Nebraskans um, without providing exceptions for really hard cases of fetal anomaly or maternal health and well being, rape or incest, um, and sometimes even having implications for family planning services or IVF. Um, Nebraskans don't want us to move down that road. Um, my sense is, is that there will continue to be a push to ban abortion in Nebraska. And it's absolutely critical that we have experienced leaders who know those issues, who know how to utilize the rules um, to protect those fundamental rights and, and access to care for people who need it. It is, I think, also really intertwined with important questions about the role of government. Um, most voters I talk to and I agree with that this should be a personal decision. This shouldn't be a governmental decision. And it is almost impossible to draft a law that encompasses and understands all of the nuances of the human condition and of pregnancy, because every pregnancy is different. And individuals need to have the opportunity to work with their healthcare providers and those they choose to consult with to decide when and if they just start they want to start a family because those are personal decisions. Uh, so I am absolutely prepared to lead on those issues. I understand the case law. I understand um, the rules and the process. And I have been really excited to see more and more Nebraskans across the political spectrum really step forward to let their voices be heard on those issues. My sense is, is that Nebraska will not be repealing any of the current restrictions on abortion care. But I do think Nebraskans don't want us to move forward with a total ban or additional restrictions. All right. Um, should the legislature scrap nonpartisanship? Um, no, absolutely not. No. I was going to guess no. that would be your answer, but okay. <laughs> No. And, and this, I think, is really foundational to all of the other issues that are present before the legislature. Again, the Nebraskans I talk to and what I know in my heart to be true cherish our beloved unicameral legislature and its hallmark of being nonpartisan, both um, in spirit and intent. People do not want more partisanship in their government. They want less partisanship. They honor the Nebraska unicameral legislature's approach, and they want us to protect us, protect that. And we need to. And those battles are absolutely brewing at the forefront. There are efforts to dismantle the rules and dismantle the filibuster system. There are efforts to diminish um, secret ballot for committee chairs. And those might not sound like a big deal to everyday people, or they might be thinking, how does that impact my life? Those are foundational pieces that are critical to the infrastructure of the nonpartisan unicameral legislature that keep it nonpartisan, that allow for good ideas and leaderships to be recognized without punishments from partisan interests. Um, it's also important to remember 
that you never know in the unicameral system how that 25 or how those 33 votes are going to shift and change on any specific issue. So it's important that we protect the filibuster rules to protect minority rights. Those might be protecting unpopular um, the unpopular issues or positions. Um, it may also come down to um, providing protections for rural interests as our state um, becomes more, more urban with those demographic shifts to the east. So you never know how those, those votes are gonna break down, but we need to have mechanisms in place that allow for the, for the rule of the majority to carry the day, but that protect minority rights um, for those key issues that you might be thinking of or might not be thinking of that might come into play um, with utilization of the filibuster rules and ensuring that we have a thoughtful process in place for committee chairs. All right, I have one last question, but before that, uh, Kent always has a question or three, so <laughs> fire away, Mr. Wogamot. Yeah, well, we're uh, running a little short on time. I know, time. it goes so fast. So I'll, I'll give you a choice of three. Okay. Uh, you want to talk about the proposed water projects, the canal and the lake, uh, the uh, need for a new prison or not, or uh, property tax, your choice. <laughs> Wow, that's a that's a very challenging. Uh, each of those could take a half an hour, right? Um, I, I I could try and do a lightning round, or all right, hit all three of them if you can. I I, I can uh, jump in a little bit here because I think there might be a through line there or a common thread through some of those pieces. But one thing that I'm thinking about when I look at those three really critical areas and issues, of course is impacts that um, we have from a state budgetary perspective. So having served for eight years on the State Appropriations Committee and being intimately and actively involved in those issues, I continue to read general fund receipts every month, continue to see where we are. And we have, it's slowing down a little bit over the summer, but we are seeing a couple of really unique factors. One, historic revenues provided through federal relief programs related to COVID and infrastructure and state general tax revenues continue to outpace projections. So we have a really mind boggling opportunity to make historic investments in Nebraska today and, and that will change the face of Nebraska for generations. I firmly believe that those resources need to be devoted to building um, up our, and ch our, our workforce challenges and the issues attendant there too infrastructure, childcare, mental health, education, those are really the key pieces where we find a lot of common ground and can and should move forward together. When it comes to some of the water projects that have been proposed, I'm glad the legislature pumped the brakes on that um, and provided for an opportunity for more study rather than moving forward rashly. I think that we are all deeply concerned about our water needs in Nebraska, but I don't think reigniting a hundred year water battle with our sister state in Colorado is gonna be the best way to solve that challenge. Um, when it comes to our corrections crisis, we continue to be at the top of one of those lists we won't wanna be at with a significant overcrowding crisis. Um, and I think we have to start where we can again find consensus. The CJI process um, hit some roadblocks last session, but there is a lot of energy and consensus around the consensus items in that thoughtful proposal. So at the very least, we need to move forward with those as soon as possible. And we need to build up and make investments on the front end. Things like diversion, mental health courts, drug courts, veterans courts. We know that those are less expensive and have better outcomes than building a prison. And when it comes to property tax, that's also related to our state budget. Um, and we have made progress in recent years in terms of providing property tax relief to more Nebraskans. Um, but we need to make sure that we heed that cautionary tale out of states like Kansas and that we don't blow a hole in our budget so that we're not able to take care of future needs as there remains a lot of economic uncertainty, um, even though things are a bit rosier today. So I think one way that we can 
tackle that is by um, really ensuring that we fully fund education to lessen reliance on property taxes at the local level. Um, but we need to be very wary of any sort of arbitrary um, lids that inhibit local control and people's ability um, to make decisions about what the best kind of school, what the best kind of infrastructure might be for their school district, their city, or their county. So we need to work collaboratively with local governments to lessen that reliance on property tax, but also to recognize that Nebraskans, you know, are really struggling uh, with those ever increasing costs and are really getting pinched um, at the pump and with inflation and with taxes. So one thing that I would really like to see Nebraska do on the tax equity side of things um, is to really focus instead on revisiting a middle class tax cut that middle class Nebraskans were left out of in the last legislative session and exploring things like a state child care tax credit, which I think would really bolster our workforce development efforts and provide wide support across the state and across the political spectrum, recognizing there's many hardworking Nebraskans who don't qualify for child um, care programs, but are, are really getting crunched by those costs and are making decisions about whether or not to leave or stay in the workforce because of how burdensome childcare costs can, can be for their family and the lack of quality childcare that may be available in their communities. As a, a mom, a working mom of two, two young children, I, I understand those, those needs um, very well. Those are kitchen table issues we deal with uh, consistently. So I think really the through line there, Kent, is to look at that from a budgetary perspective and figure out, you know, how we can be most thoughtful at this critical juncture and making key investments to move Nebraska forward. All right. Um, well, the last question, you did a lot uh, with, you did a lot of, with that. That speed round was a good job. Um, the last question is just simply, what have we not asked that you wish we would have? Oh, gosh. Um, we did cover a lot of ground. It was always, it's always yeah, I should have warned you in advance that was going to be the last question. <laughs> it's always so fun to connect. Um, I, I just really want to thank you all for the opportunity. I've been honored to have the Journal Star's endorsement in, I believe, all of my past campaigns. Um, and I would be honored to have it again. I um, am working really, really hard to make a positive difference in our beloved Nebraska. I um, actually wish that my opponent and I in this race lived in different districts. Um, we share a lot of the same values. We're both very public spirited minded. Um, but the key distinguishing factor is the experience and the leadership in the legislative arena. I have done that for almost two decades in a variety of capacities, including eight behind the glass. Um, it's critical now more than ever because of term limits and retirements that we have people who can lead on day one because those foundational questions about the structure of the unicameral are coming very, very early in 2023, whether that's the rules debate, whether that's the committee chairs debate and otherwise. And if we don't have balance on our committees, if we don't have thoughtful and responsible rules available to us, the rest is the rest. So it's important that voters remember um, that they have an opportunity in this race um, to not just secure a vote that may align with their interests and ideas, but to secure a leader in the legislature who can deliver for working families, protecting our nonpartisan unicameral legislature and be not only a strong voice, even when it's unpopular, but a bridge to the other side of the political spectrum and across the state. I've done that in my career. I'm doing that in this campaign. I'm excited about the future of Nebraska. Um, and I'm working really hard. So people can check out the websites and the social media and all those things you're supposed to say. I'm, I'm not really um, the most uh, um, adept at, at all of those social media things, but I can promise you I won't be getting in any Twitter battles with my colleagues. I'm going to be rolling up my sleeves and doing the hard work to, to figure out how we can move the state forward. All right. Well, Danielle, thank you for spending uh, 30 minutes with us. Uh, Thank you. We appreciate your time and we wish you the best. Thank you so much. Good luck with the process. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Kent. We didn't see your kitties. <laughs> oh, he's right here. Come on. Ah!
Oh, he gets a cameo. A uh, cameo appearance. Oh, okay. There All right. Kitty. <laughs> Thanks a bunch.